Hello, Richard Tromans here again at Artificial Lawyer TV, and today we've got with us Elevate's Brian Kuhn, um, who joined fairly recently from IBM. Uh, hi, Brian. Hello, how are you? Very good, thanks. How are you? Very well. Fantastic. Well, I thought it'd be interesting to let the, uh, the audience know a little bit about what you're doing at Elevate, um, some of the projects perhaps we could talk about, and some of the things that you may have learned while you were at IBM. So let's just start off with the basics. Um, what is your job now? What are you actually doing? So I run our technology and digital, and I'll describe that distinction, uh, consulting practice uh, globally. Anything to do with technology and its customization uh, to solve business problems, whether it's implementing third-party technology or designing uh, new capabilities with artificial intelligence. Gotcha, gotcha. And when you say using artificial intelligence, let's just be kind of precise about that. We're talking about NLP software, natural language processing software, or are we, or are we talking about different kinds of artificial intelligence? Uh, We're talking about uh, toolkits, whether it's uh, proprietary capabilities that are analytics-based, like predictive analytics, um, whether it's based on open source software, uh, certain RPA technology, for example, or whether it's um, you know, based upon uh, AWS, um, we're trying to identify best-in-class capabilities, create capabilities when it makes sense to do so, uh, and, and, and build a toolkit of different piece parts, like Lego blocks, that we can quickly assemble because they talk to each other around a customer's business problem in various ways. Gotcha. Okay, well, let, let's have a look at some examples, maybe. We, we, can, we can rip off the name of the client. But I mean, could you give me a classic example of something you've done since you've joined Elevate? Sure. So one of the major initiatives has been to develop a, develop a solution for outside council spend reduction that goes beyond invoice review. It's called Council Context, and we'll be releasing it shortly. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Council Context, um, on the one hand, there are five use cases associated with it. Uh, so it is a solution from a consulting perspective, meaning that we build it, let's say, to 80% capability, and that's the same from customer to customer, uh, law departments being the customers, and the remaining 20% we customize based upon the legal matter types, the data, in other words, mm -hmm. um, that a customer has. And we're able to take billing narratives and task codes and use artificial intelligence to understand all the various ways lawyers can describe similar tasks in the context of individual matter types and associate the right code. And then we can do spend analytics, who's you know, being a good player, who's compliant with outside council guidelines and budgets. Those are table stakes, however. The real thing behind the, the under the table is, is the fact that we are building ontologies. We're building language libraries, in other words, that understand the weight, the meaning, the concepts, uh, associated with individual matter types like automobile bodily injury negligence or director and officer liability um, or IP litigation, where similar concepts can be expressed, but they have a different meaning. And if you're going to benchmark how long it should take to accomplish something, that context makes sense. Once you can take all the ways lawyers describe things and again, map them back to common meanings, within an order of magnitude, then you can do more interesting things because you have better data. For example, root cause analysis. It's one thing to know outside counsel is compliant with your guidelines, but it's more important, I would argue, to know what value you're getting. Is it good? So being able to associate the activities that outside counsel describes and bills for, plot them along a timeline, and understand the effect that they have on the outcome of a matter. Did filing a certain motion in a certain jurisdiction tend to have a net positive or negative outcome so that you can get outside counsel to do more of that if it's positive, less of that if it's negative, or right size from a database, from a, from a data-driven perspective, your um, uh, fixed fee billing strategy. From there, the two remaining use cases are budget prediction and settlement prediction, which we call settlement forecasting um, because we want to respect the fact that ultimately the end user, the subject matter expert, will be the one taking the action and interpreting the results that we feed up 
one of the thoughts that came to mind when you were saying that was standardization. Right. So, right. you know, and for me, standardization is going to be absolutely critical in the years ahead. If we're going to get where we need to get to, if we're going to reduce the overall cost of legal services to society and the commercial legal world, um, we're going to have to move away from the billable hour. And the only way to do that really is to get some confidence around what yeah. things cost. And of course, it's very difficult because you need to analyze it and so forth. And so, you know, um, what you're doing there is very, very useful, it sounds. I mean, will this help to drive standardization, at least within that organization? What you say is, is, is it raises a very interesting point because in order to get to standardization, we need customization. Mm -hmm. yeah. In other words, you, you as a law department are not going to make strategic decisions based upon generic data, based upon benchmarked market data. Let's say that data is anonymized, right? And even, even so, general trends, you, it might be useful for you to know how much similar services cost you know, and, and your peer companies are paying for them. But you're not going to make decisions about whether to settle a case. You're not going to make decisions about, uh, about budgeting um, from a... From, from based upon general data. Only, only by understanding and interpreting legal concepts in the right context can we get to generalization. And doing so requires looking at what you want to accomplish as a business. So I can tell you what, you, what I think you want, and I can give you a widget, and you can have the same capability as your peer company, or I can hand you a 80% piece of, of clay and refine it with you based upon your unique goals, based upon your data. Um, and if you have enough data really to fuel good actionable insights, which is key, uh, which is something that we should discuss. Mm -hmm. So standardization, I believe, will, will be enabled uh, through high, de high degrees of configurability and customization that understand context, because you are different than your peer company, your data is different, your business goals are different. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. Well, I guess even if even if a large, it's only just one single large company that's that's standardizing, that is a great step forward. And if we can get a bunch of other companies to standardize, even if they're not doing it with you, they, they're using maybe yeah. a whole different set of concepts. Who knows? But if we can start to get corporates, you know, the Fortune five hundred at least, all the big publicly listed corporates around the planet, if we can get them to standardize the majority of their legal work at least. Yeah stuff that doesn't you know the stuff that you know not life and death you know we, we've we got sued by the eu on a competition matter once. right but the bread and butter stuff and yeah and and, and beyond that and, and even beyond that i mean anything that's that's occurred two or three times i guess we can get some modeling out of can't we we can we can and only with that benchmarking once we know what a complete picture likes it looks like from beginning to end only then can we produce useful insights yeah well and that's i mean that's the thing i mean for me this is it's funny really because i mean you know i mean artificial law obviously is about legal technology supposedly but really it's about economics that's what that's what fascinates me and that's what you know got me into this whole malarkey mm -hmm. and what you realize really that the way to actually activate you might say legal technology is through examining the money Right. Yeah. And it's funny as well, because I mean, on this side, it's two sided, isn't it? You're using tech to produce economic insights, which then drive fixed fees from the providers who then in turn need to use technology on their side of the other far end of that equation to enable them to meet those fixed fees and still generate the profit margins they expect. So you kind of got economics. It's like an economic sandwich with tech as the bread on both sides. Does that I mean, am I? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's a great point. Um, it, it, it dovetails with what I believe is the purpose. When we say digital strategy, I mean, that's very broad. It can mean almost anything. Um, and digital strategy consulting, it's, it's basically, for instance, um, we don't want to digitize the cow path. So we wouldn't just go in and digitize, automate, in this case, bad processes. So we might sell a process optimization engagement and execute on it with technology. The technology is a subplot to the business goal or the economic goal, if that's the business goal. Ultimately, what this comes down to is that technology is, 
when we talk about digital transformation, we decidedly and ironically maybe don't, don't mean technological transformation. What we mean is the way that technology changes the conditions under which people do business because yeah. they have more insight. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, let lawyers be lawyers, let them do their lawyery thing. It's, yeah. it, I mean, who cares, really? They're, they'll just carry on being lawyers and giving advice and turn, turning up in court. Let them do that. That's fine. It's everything else. If you have a 90%, you know, they're sitting on this gigantic pyramid of activity mm -hmm. and processes and knowledge and et cetera, et cetera. And but that's, that's where everything can change. I mean, you're not going to change the advice that a great lawyer gives a client with technology. I mean, they might maybe get some yeah. additional insights from using some souped up legal research system that kind of helps them get some additional insight, perhaps maybe some predictive stuff to give some particular insights on a big piece of litigation. Maybe, maybe some of that, but generally it's a very human thing, but it's all the processes that feed in to that end result. I guess it's like, I guess it's kind of like, I suppose it's like NASA, isn't it? You've got these two guys or whoever, in that little capsule and then you've got the rocket and then you've got you know nasa's um you know pad 39 or whatever it is and then you've got all these other nasa bases and then you've got all these different companies and you've got scientists spreading across the whole planet and they're all feeding into this thing but that thing is incredibly complicated so right now uh, I, I believe that in 2017 uh, 200 and some odd million dollars were invested in legal technology startups in the US. In 2018, it was over a billion USD. In 2019, again, it was over a billion USD, 1.1, 1.2. And th the space has been discovered uh, by savvy venture capitalists who don't just provide money, they provide advice to founders. And what are those founders doing? I think this, this, this is important to mention. What are those companies doing? They're taking strategic little bites out of traditional value chains. They're focusing on doing one thing, part of a larger process, really, really well. Better, they would say, than a law firm could. One little thing. They're not trying to completely disrupt and disintermediate law firms. But mm -hmm. what they're focusing on are areas that end users, whether they're people within a law firm or the law firm's clients, um, that end users experience pain and friction with because there are long wait times, because there's delay, whatever it is, whatever the problem is, they solve that problem, which tends to be a problem of friction very, very well. Mm. And it's important to note that that trend, that trend of, of personalization, of reducing friction for the end user, of acknowledging the fact that good technology is becoming table stakes, it's more about applying it than having it now. Mm. There are a million ways to apply it. One, finding out how to do that is very complicated. You can't, it, it, it's now strategic. Um, technology is so configurable that you need to understand your why. And, you know, two, $1.2 trillion were invested in, um, in digital transformation projects globally uh, last year, according to IDC. $1.2 trillion, a third of all IT spending globally. So there's definitely something going on. It's definitely coming to this industry. And it's not just about technology anymore. It's about the strategic application of technology. Absolutely. Well, tech, tech is always just a means to an end. Uh, and I think that's, yeah. unfortunately, that's one of the problems with all, not just legal tech, but any FinTech, you name it, any little village, um, is that it gets wrapped up in itself. You know, it's just a means to an end. And law, law, and law itself is just a means to an end, which is to help businesses, well, at least commercial law, do their thing so they can provide goods and services to society at large. So you're, you're, you're multiple steps removed. You but know. what you'll see, I think, going forward is companies looking at the business implications of their legal problems, which I, I suppose really, I mean, this, it's a distinction without a difference. Um, and going as far upstream as possible to prevent the business scenarios that result in litigation, for example, or at least uh, uh, reduce them going forward because other, other lines of business within large companies have been doing things with AI for a long time, mm. such that enterprises are learning lessons. This is one of their advantages over law firms. 
um, somewhere within the business, someone's done something. You know, usually with, with, with one of the large, with one of the Fortune 500 companies, for example, I, I believe almost all of them have done something. So they're able to learn from those lessons when it comes to the law department. And when the CFO says, you know, we need to show a billion dollar savings to the street and we're going to look for that savings across the business. Now we're going to look for it in part within the law department because we expect mm. the same efficiencies. I read a statistic, insurance companies, 79%, and I can get you this information in the source material, 79% of insurance company GCs say that their CEOs are now looking for savings within law departments. So let's, let's just look at just step back from this particular sure. thing just for a second right the elevate started off as effectively you might say a process focused um legal services business right you know and alsp they don't like to be called alsps understandably i just call them process focused legal services businesses why is elevate providing tech consulting services to two corporates now? Part of it is demand. Mm. Um, uh, our, our customers will often ask for these capabilities when, they're, when we're serving them in another context. Uh, clearly, they're, again, they're seeing benefits from automation, so they're asking us for our point of view on automation and on data reuse. Mm. Um, but it's also the fact that Elevate is in a unique position in, in terms of having subject matter experts who touch multiple areas within, you know, the, the, across the spectrum of legal expertise. And frankly, you can create better AI and you can optimize processes more efficiently when you have a large group of people, a large group of experts to call upon uh, to inform what you're going to do with technology and, and, and make it work. So it's not just the tech, it's that the tech is underpinned by different business focus areas and different subject matter experts whose point of view adds material value. But it, I suppose an inter one interesting aspect perhaps is that the more you help in-house legal teams understand costs and just in fact the entire corporate to understand legal expenditure and as you're saying, you know, sort of upstream causes and so forth, it drives greater demand for Elevate and its services, which is there to sort of pick up the ball, which perhaps some of the law firms have dropped because they can't so readily address those sort of more sort of structured needs. I mean, law firms are great at just saying, well, give us your problem. We'll throw a ton of bodies at it and then we'll give you the bill at the end. We don't, we have no clue what it's going to cost. We have no clue where we're going, but it's, it's all going to be fine. Don't worry. It's, it's going to cost you a ton of money, but hey, you're good for it. Don't worry. Hey, and it's not your money anyway. It's for shareholders. Shh, don't worry about it. I mean, the the sort of process focused businesses who are not necessarily regulated law firms, you know, they are so much better, um, you know, structured to, to handle these these needs, I would guess. And so what you're doing plays into Elevate's broader business plan. It, it plays into Elevate's broader business plan, but ultimately what we want to do is, uh, is, is, is help um, law departments and law firms solve these big thorny problems, problems related to competition, uh, problems related to cost takeout, problems related to, you know, hey, a legacy practice area that we as a law firm have uh, is, is no longer generating as much revenue. How are we gonna replace that revenue? What are we going to do? helping law departments um, determine the value that they're getting for their service. Um, providing more, more data and better insights along with a plan for how to act upon them because that's critical. It's not enough to just serve up insights. Uh, the goal is to enable our customers, um, whether they're law firms or law departments, uh, to help them succeed um, as opposed to, you know, supposed to competing with them yeah though well i mean that's one of the things as well i mean he, well we're going slightly off subject but i mean obviously elevate and all the other companies in in this in that sector have to be they're playing a, an interesting game in that quite often they're working directly with the law firms and to some degree their very existence is undermining the kind of laissez-faire hourly billing hey, you know, you take all the risk model that is big law. 
Um, but let's move on, let's move on, let's move on. Um, got to wrap it up in a few minutes. So just last real sort of big question, which is, I mean, IBM is an incredible company uh, steeped in knowledge and experience. I mean, what did you learn at IBM that you've been able to apply to, to your work at Elevate? Very practically, the technology alone is not enough. And when I say very practic practically, and I say very practically, not practically, um, here's what I mean. With data science, and the legal industry right now has a love affair with data science, and data science is great, but data science is based upon statistics. And the results that are produced with analytics are, from a data science perspective, driven less to some degree, I mean, this can be argued, it's almost a philosophical question, some will disagree with this, uh, but less by know-how and more by, by the pure data and what the data says. That will get you only so far. What IBM taught me was the importance of infusing business subject matter know-how into a data science process to produce better AI. Uh, and not just the importance, but how to do it. How to perhaps begin to solve or participate in solving one of the most fundamental problems associated with AI across industries, which is getting information out of heads of people who know how and into a machine. Uh, the right people, the right information. So to make this concrete, imagine that you're trying to locate information within a document management system and you're trying to uh, you're a law department and you're trying to repurpose information that you bought, paid for, own and store that outside counsel produced for you, or perhaps that you produced for yourself in the past in the context of your current challenge. And you, you want to surface information based upon relevance to your inquiry. Well, when, when it's unclear whether something is blue or red, let's say the machine learning algorithm has an 80% confidence and it's unclear, often the only way to get from 80% to something approaching 100% is for someone who really understands uh, to declare that is red, that is blue. And although that's not novel, the process of infusing subject matter expertise conveniently, the process of baking that into a machine learning algorithm, that is novel. That is something that a lot of organizations have experimented with and it's quite clunky and, and we have a pretty unique, I think, wholly unique approach for respecting the time of lawyers who are busy and you know, not just turning to a group of random, random people who know something about contracts or something about whatever domain we're talking about, but actual subject matter experts, you perhaps, the customer, mm -hmm. and, and allowing you to infuse your know-how in a convenient way that's not time intensive and that's very user-friendly, looks like briefing a case, uh, into a AI-based solution and improve it in the context of what you as a business are trying to achieve. So it's, it's really what I learned at IBM was that when people talked about AI augmentation at IBM Watson, not replacement, but augmentation, mm -hmm. that's what they meant and it was genuine. And that's what, what I am bringing to elevate with this consulting practice and, and, and my team is, uh, is, is working on right now. Awesome, fantastic. Well, look, last, uh, very last thing, uh, in a single sentence, uh, what uh -oh. biggest, I'll give you five seconds to think about this. Uh, what's the biggest difference between Elevate and IBM? Elevate is closer to the market. They're closer to the beating pulse of clients' needs, customers' needs. Um, IBM is fantastic, but they're a very large company. Nothing against IBM. Uh, Elevate has the subject matter expertise. Well, this is not one sentence. So uh, I guess I'd bring it back to Elevate is closer to the market. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. We could talk all day, uh, but we've got to end it there. So thank you very much. And we hope to have you back on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.